One of my first roles as a newly qualified psychologist was assessing police officers whose work potentially placed them at risk of adverse effects, given that the job they performed. That was a long time ago, before the days of emails, electronic versions of anything that could be scanned. So I arrived physically at the force headquarters with my car piled high, with the very best questionnaires assessing these things that you could find. I had piles of pre-printed packs of paper and was feeling very proud that this was my first time on the job for real, not in training. I turned up to the groups of officers, explained who I was, what I was doing, and why I was there. I handed out all the materials together with prepaid envelopes to return these to me, and I left feeling very satisfied that I'd done a really good job, and everyone was on board and understood the importance of the task at hand. So I returned to my office, sat back, and waited for these assessments to arrive in the post. What I actually gave them looked a lot like this. So it was questions or statements to which they responded how they felt, how often that applied to them, or how much that was like or true of them. I collected these envelopes over the ensuing weeks, like trophies in my filing tray, waiting for my return deadline to have passed before opening them. I was pleased to have received 96 out of 134 envelopes that I actually handed out. I opened all of these after my deadline had passed with my self-congratulatory metaphorical pat on the back. I had done well. I was not prepared for what I found. Over 50% of these had been returned blank. Others were not fully completed and were unusable. In total, only 25 out of those returned were actually of any use for the project at hand. My thoughts immediately jumped back. What was I missing? What had I done wrong? I thought I was credible. I thought I was professional. I thought I'd explain the importance and everyone understood that. What fault in me had there been that I only got those 25 back? I sifted through those 25, looking to see if there was any evidence of what I had done wrong in my mind. And as I sifted through, I noticed on one particular questionnaire, there was writing on the blank back side of the piece of paper that I'd given, and another page filled with text on the back, and another page filled with text on the back. So I started to read, and what unfolded was a story of human connection during a time of extreme trauma. Officers were called to a house where a suspected armed male suspect had taken his ex-wife, going to call her Lucy, not her real name, hostage. Gunshots had been heard and reports were that he was threatening to shoot her and anyone who came anywhere near the house. Officer A was tasked with establishing communication with anyone inside. He was able to make contact with Lucy on her terrestrial phone. Officer A talked to Lucy about her life and the things in it. At that point, she confirmed she had indeed been shot and needed medical attention urgently. However, the house was inaccessible. He talked to her about her life, her dreams, her hopes for the next three hours. And as time went on, the talk turned to her fears that she was going to die, that she would not see her children. Officer A wrote very heartfeltly how he really empathised with that as a parent himself. As the call finally came that the house had been secured, Officer A ran into the room that Lucy had described and found her barely conscious on the floor. He was able to reach her just in time to take her in his arms as she died. He felt guilty he could not do more. Humanity. My pages of lovely pre-printed questionnaires didn't tell that story. I was asking questions about how bothered you were by this. Were you sleeping well? Did it affect your irritability? None of that was reflected 
in the story I was given. And at that moment, I realised that the effects of psychological trauma could not be represented as simple tick boxes on a page. At this time, the newly labelled psychological disorder relating to exposure to traumatic events, post-traumatic stress disorder, which I will continually refer to as PTSD, was the subject of my then and subsequent work. There are now two published categorisations, legally accepted, defensible and widely used, of PTSD. One of these is in the catchy titled Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, and that's published by the American Psychiatric Association. Another catchy title, the International Classification of Diseases, published by the World Health Organization, also specifies the nature of these reactions. Collectively, these are termed the medical models. And these are literally manuals. They are how-tos. They determine the scope, content, frequency, duration of your reactions to psychological trauma. They determine at which point in time and at which thresholds of experience you become a disordered person. I am here today to talk to you about what these medically driven assumptions of PTSD represent in the context of being human. What erroneous assumptions they hold about the human condition and what influences and continues to influence them in their construction and content. There are five assumptions I'm going to introduce you to. These are mine that I believe are inherent in these diagnostic classifications. I will introduce you to each of them and explain how they affect both the way the disorder is positioned and they represent the experience of those that they tend to capture in the information in them. I'm an academic psychologist. I'm a psychotherapist, coach, trainer, educator and consultant. I've worked now in the field of psychological trauma for over 30 years. And in that time, I've seen many changes to the way that psychological trauma is captured in the diagnosis PTSD. And the majority of these have been as a result of changes that have been made based on research, sound research evidence. However, these changes are also not made in a vacuum. They are not free from the social, cultural and political influences of the world we live in today. So one of the first inherent assumptions I believe that these diagnostic criteria have is the one I've already alluded to. The ability to put things in boxes. Now I call this boxology. Ology meaning knowledge of and boxes, well, you get the picture, self-explanatory. So the boxes here are the diagnostic criteria in the definitions. They effectively categorise what events are considered to be traumatic, what, what qualifies you after an event for a diagnosis, and the number and types of symptoms you have to have. This effectively reduces normal reactions to an abnormal event, which is what psychological trauma is, into a biologically driven tick box exercise. This puts the experience of human distress and misery out of context. That context is lost. It is inherently reductionist and entirely consistent with a medical view of psychological trauma. In fact, in predefining what PTSD is in this way, people using these diagnostic criteria only go and find what they're looking for because they look just for the things that are in those definitions. The diagnostic classifications of PTSD ignore important aspects and influences on the human experience after a traumatic event. This leads to the second assumption. The second assumption is that PTSD is real. It's a thing, it's as tangible as you and I sat here. The assumption here is one of fact. PTSD is a fact, it exists. It is measurable, calculable, it is definable in the ways that the post-traumatic stress is defined in the diagnostic categories. However, I challenge that 
what PTSD actually is, is a hypothetical construct used to define lived experience in a very narrow and particular way. That is not to negate anyone's experience of distress and suffering, but rather not to assume that this collection of categories and criteria actually represents a version of reality. So when we look then at the development of PTSD as a disorder, we can see where the po political and social influences have shaped its existence, and that challenges that view of it being a concrete entity. Let's look back. It first came to public attention in the World War I version of what was then shell shock. Shell shock was used to define a disorder that was psychological in its nature, often in the absence of any physical symptoms. However, by 1916, the sheer number of people with this diagnosis led to a move, an alleged desire to move away from the term. The term implied that the fault was the war, that that caused the problem. So, as many of you be aware, I'm sure this led to a term called malingering and cowardice. And cowardice was something that was a crime. And 307 people were shot during the course of World War I for cowardice. Fast forward to World War II, and we have terms such as malingering and war neuroses, soldier's heart, and my favourite, lacking moral fibre, for which the punishment was more military discipline. These terms all turn to problematise the individual themselves and not locate the source of the problem in the environment or the context. In 1952, the first ever Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, fondly called the DSM, was published and here we had, for the first time, a disorder relating to what was then called a gross stress reaction. And a gross stress reaction was a temporary disorder located purely in the effects of war. It was seen as short-lived and only for a time, short time after returning from war itself. However, if we fast forward again, returning Vietnam veterans were left with no access to the longer term symptoms that they were experiencing. They had, in the US, they had no access to treatment, to compensation or to recognition. And at that point, trauma became political. Post-traumatic stress disorder was subject to the wide campaigning for recognition for veterans' problems and issues that they experienced as a result of that war. And that led, to, in 1980, to the first classification of post-traumatic stress disorder in the third edition of the DSM. However, it didn't stop there. In the 80s, feminist campaigners claimed that the patriarchal nature of the war-based recognition in the newly termed post-traumatic stress disorder did not allow for victims of child abuse, sexual abuse, domestic violence to have recognition in the same way. So again, this was widened. And there are more examples. But the point here is this is a social and political construction not constructed in a vacuum and not a concrete fact. The third inherent assumption in the diagnostic category for psychological trauma is that it is portrayed as an abnormal state in the way that it is phrased. Even the term disorder itself is synonymous with illness and problem. The symptoms in the published diagnostic criteria include things like bad dreams, and thinking about the event when you didn't mean to, it pops into your head. Avoiding reminders of the event, very sensible for me, if you actually were distressed at the time, why would you want to expose yourself further? So these are not signs of illness. These are not signs of deficit. These are purely normal human reactions to deeply disturbing and distressing events. So by negating the person as a whole and separating them into discrete units, we are often missing these things as vital ways of coping with what's going on for that person following a traumatic event. 
The danger here is pathologising those behaviours leads to a problematisation of the individual themselves rather than the thing that they have experienced. And the lens comes to ask what's wrong with you and to represent a problem. The fourth inherent assumption is that prior to trauma, we all live happy lives. Stable states exist before trauma happens to us. Many of us know other people, and I'm sure ourselves, if we cast now our mind to our friends, our associates, our colleagues, who has lived their life free from adversity, free from grief, free from tragedy? These things are part of our human condition. Yet the diagnostic manuals have the same starting point. A stable pre-trauma state that is only disrupted by that one event that you have experienced. And that too easily assumes that solid and stable sense of self that's just not available to many people in society. And it fails to account for the detrimental effects that this has on the ongoing and sustained dynamics of social and moral injury to non-dominant or marginalised groups who live in times where they are subject to structural poverty, financial difficulties, etc. For many of these groups, the world is not safe and that is their normal. And the diagnostic criteria ignores the impact of this. The fifth inherent assumption is that PTSD and the diagnostic criteria represent a universal set of responses to an event. This universality is present in two ways. One is that the effects of psychological trauma is universal in, exper in that everyone experiencing it will experience it in the same way. And secondly, it is universal in terms of representing a worldwide picture of the common effects of exposure to traumatic events. Firstly, we know not everyone who experiences a traumatic event gets PTSD. In fact, a recent study in 2020 looked at the lifetime exposure to trauma in the general population. 71%. 71% of people in the general population will have at least one traumatic event in their lifetime. How many of those develop PTSD? 2%. 2% of that 71, not 2% of the general population. So we know that this is not a universal response to psychological trauma. Secondly, PTSD is a Western invention. It is culturally bound within the Western constructs that created it. When this is transported then to other cultures, where the conceptualisation of human distress is actually expressed very differently, then that ignores those local social norms and traditions that not only is likely to fail in terms of an explanation, but potentially also could cause more damage. These explanations and traditions of dealing with human distress arising from adversity are potentially epistemically threatened by the assumption of universality and reactions to adverse life events that this Western creation of PTSD brings. So, finally today, as you may be aware, I have not come to give you any clever answers but I come to urge you to ask more questions. Questions about the validity and usefulness of these medical models of the experience of traumatic life events in understanding what truly happens to people who have experienced traumatic things in their lifetime. As Einstein put it, if I had an hour to solve a problem, 55 minutes of that would be spent on knowing or figuring out the right question to ask. So it is knowing what question to ask. Let's go back to Officer A. Officer A, his experience could not be captured in the boxes on my forms. His experience was not defined by knowing how often he struggled to go to sleep or if he was bothered by the event three or four times a week or once a day. In fact, he refused to be bound by that. He wanted to tell his story in the context it occurred. And that was central to our understanding of that experience. 
So the question I leave you with today, is it more useful to have a focus on what is wrong with you and to label the effects of these experiences as defective or disordered? Or is it more useful to meet on the level of humanity and ask what happened to you and how does the context in which you experience that help us understand how you've been affected? Thank you for listening.